Okay, Kent. My name's Ken. I own the garden center, and I've been gardening here in the mountains of Arizona for a lot of decades. A lot of years. Learned a couple things. Some things to struggle with, some things to kind of avoid. My goal today is get you at least three things that you can implement this season. I mean, right now, that'll make a difference in your gardens. I mean, you'll see a pronounced difference in the quantity, the size, the harvest. We're mainly talking about edibles today. And so the vegetable, I am going to go home this afternoon and garden. I'm going to put a few things in, a few things, not all. I'm not going to put all my eggs in the spring basket because it can, uh, it can uh, kill them. So we did put a frost warning out on Wednesday. Did anyone get that? Yeah, good. Oh, well, good. So I figured I better let my, I was worried about it. Of course, I've got lots of inventory that can be damaged or killed, so we have great interest in monitoring this. We have different sources. We really hone in on this. So I got a whole team. We just worry. You know, nothing but sit around and worry about the weather. <laughs> and so I thought, this is pretty serious. I should let my friends and, and our core core customers know what we're doing and why, why we're concerned. So we sent that out. And it took five minutes. It took like no time to just go here, send it out. There were like nine thousand of you. They got the got the got the got the info. Just locals. So there's nine thousand of you are part of our garden club. It's meant to be a, a local a here local resource. I mean in the region, central Yavapai. So I'm glad that you all you all got that. It did make a difference. I lost my apricots. But I saved my cherries. And that's the way it is in the mountains. You just never quite know. And we can have frost again. All the new folks, over half the group was new. I keep hearing every day, they go, oh, that's the last frost, right, Ken? Uh -oh. No, it's not the last frost. We'll have more. May 8th, Mother's Day. That's what we locals use as the holiday, as the average last frost date. You want to write that one down, May 8th. And you want to write down October 28th. That's the first frost of the season. Now, these are 100-year averages. So it's Halloween and Mother's Day. Those are our... Our, our targets that we track. Uh, that's a hundred years of data. We've been tracking this for a lot, for a century. We've been tracking this. The funny thing about averages is it's never May 8th. 50 of those years, it was May 15th. The other 50 years, it was April 20, you know, 18th or whatever. But the average is in the middle somewhere. And so this, this year, it felt like it was about three weeks early. It felt like it was warmer earlier. The winter was not as cold. So it lulled me into thinking that I could plant some things. I did plant a few things. I was able to protect them. I did all that stuff I wrote to you all. I did all that stuff. I saved everything except apricots. I mean, you know, they've been in bloom forever. They've been in bloom for a month and a half. My cherries, they did have little tiny cherries on them. I don't know why that one saved and the other one didn't. It just decided apricots are wimps. If they're, it's cold at all, they're gonna shed their fruit. That's just the way they are. Nectarines the same way. Cherries and peaches are a little more robust. Apples and pears, they look like they're golden. They're they're set, they're ready. This is gonna be a really good apple and pear year, I predict. Um, but don't be lulled into thinking I can plant all my tomatoes, because tomatoes are a tropical plant. If you're cold, if you need a vest outside, they need a parka. So your basil, the same way. I mean, if it gets cold at all, they're gonna peel over and die, or at least turn purple and yellow and wimpy and they'll start growing and they'll whine and complain about how cold they are. Wait, do not plant too early some of those things, especially the really sensitive things. Uh, eggplants, cucumbers, really sensitive to the cold. I'm, this afternoon, I'm going to plant some. I'm going to plant four tomatoes I've picked out. I'm not sure which ones and why. This gardener is picking those. I'm going to plant some peppers. And I brought, so this is what I use. I brought, these are actually mine from home. These are called plant protectors. I know they look kind of skanky because they've been used for years and years. <coughs> but what they are, and I just keep them stored. What they are is I'll plant my tomato. And then I'll put this little circular thing around it. And then it's got these little tubes that you fill up with water. They used to call them walls of water. Because you'd fill up these tubes. And so this actually turns into a little teepee. It collapses around. 
your plants. If you're going to plant early, and I encourage, plant early, plant often. I got two kids to get through college. Please. <laughs> plant early, plant often. But if, but if you're going to do that, I'm going to do these early, especially with my tropical things. So that the, I'll plant, I'm not going to plant basil yet, but tomatoes and peppers, I'm going to plant a few, not all of them, a few. What this does is it warms up the soil, and that's the number one thing. You think you can plant here, and the, the days are warm, but your soil temperature, take, it takes on the ambient temperature, whatever the evening is. And so if you're used to planting, let's say from the Midwest, that seems to be my biggest complaint. So those, from, those folks from the Midwest, I used to do everything through seed. I plant seed and they come right up. I planted my, my seed three weeks ago. Nothing's happened. Ken, why? Let me tell you why. It's because of the soil temperature is sitting there so cold that the seed just go, it's just too cold. I'm not going to, it's too, too risky right now. I'm going to wait and hold until it's warm enough. So your temperature really needs to be about 50 degrees for things really start taking off. How cold was it outside this, this week? 30s, 20s, 20s. 20s, yeah, 20s, 20s. low 30s, depending where you were, what, what uh, altitude, what south, northwest, it was cold. Your soil temperature is that temperature. And that's why things don't take off. You'll plant your first tomatoes and without these things, these plant protectors, they'll sit there and they'll just, they won't grow. They're not dying, they're not growing, they'll just sit there until the soil temperature gets up to a certain level and all of a sudden they explode with new growth because these are summer plants. We generally don't put summer plants in until after Mother's Day. And I'm just getting that for you new folks. This is not, it'll be nice today, you'll be tempted, you'll put the shorts on, go for a hike. Some of you guys will take your shirts off, walk around, you shouldn't do that, but you might be tempted. Uh, but it, and then it will quickly turn. It'll turn cold again. So it's this violent up and down thing. So don't don't be low. Don't be fooled. Mother's Day. Uh, plant some of these. I'll put this. I'll actually put this around my cage. Kind of collapsing around the cage. I'll just put a few. In. I mean, I've got radio shows. I've got garden columns. I got I've got a following. I've got bragging rights. I'm a gardener. You have to be the first one in your neighborhood to pick the fruit and describe how good it was. <laughs> ah, how delicious. I'm so glad I started early. And how are you doing? <laughs> There's bragging rights, right, as a gardener? You, you kind of want a few, but not all of them. Also, don't plant all of your broccoli, all of your eggplant, all at once. Because then all of a sudden you're buried alive with this huge harvest. It's better to plant in two-week sequence. sequence. I kind of go in two week intervals through June. I'll just plant a few of these and then I'll plant a few more. So I've got this wave of fruit coming on at me through the season. Right now I did have a kale, um, spinach. We've got a lot of cool season things that, are in, that have been in the ground. I've been harvesting sage and parsley, a lot of things all winter. There's cool season crops, then there's summer crops. I didn't cover my cool season things. Actually, they taste better when they're exposed to cold. Your leafy things, things that you harvest, either the flower like broccoli or the foliage like spinach, those things are usually cold season or early spring vegetables. Plant those in February, March. Whose phone is that? Is that me? Oh, you got the same ringtone I do. <laughs> Dang it, I forgot to tone it down. Um, anyway, the summer things, things that form fruits, those are actually planted after Mother's Day. They're more since they're more tropical. So you, you plant those things later. And a lot of folks get worried. I, I just had a couple of folks say, yeah, but I'm gonna be traveling, visiting kids, I got a trip planned. I won't be back until May 20th. I'm going, wait, plant it then, it'll be better. I've waited till the first part of June. And literally, I will catch up with you on my growth. You put yours in a month early, but because the soil was so cool, you thought you were going forward, but in real, reality, you were standing still. I waited and planted three, four weeks later, and it quickly caught right up because of warm. I put them in, and they instantly start growing. So that's the secret of that. Yeah. Couldn't you put plastic down around the plants to cover the soil so that you... Yeah, you, okay. He's saying, could I cover the soil and heat it up artificially? Yeah, you could. It could help. But still, the night times get pretty cold. Basil, if it goes below 45, it's over. It dies. I don't, it didn't need 32. It just needs to think cold thoughts 
it's gone. Tomatoes are kind of that way too. So I would say plant protectors are best. Protect the foliage and the soil. Don't just do the soil. Now some of you have greenhouses. I call that cheating. <laughs> That's, I don't have those at home. I got them in the commercially. I got them at home. I'm just soil out there. Okay, and I'm on the north slope. I'm up at 5,700 feet. The vistas are beautiful. The wind is terrible, and it's cold. So I have to protect them individual plants, and just a few. And so that, that's, that's the first bit of advice I can give you is that. And I'll, I'll show you some other examples. What I do have, I do actually have a garden calendar. I didn't print that off. I gave you the tomato sheet. Uh, it actually is a few tips on how to actually make tomatoes produce better, faster. And I'll give you some of the inside scoops because you're here on what I personally do in addition to that. I also have a vegetable calendar. That is, when do you plant carrots? When do you put cucumbers? When do you put broccoli? When do you put, it's a calendar for here. It's not something downloaded off of Google that's like, that doesn't work. It's local, it's, it's for here. If you want, it's a two page thing, it's pretty extensive. It also tells you how many plants to feed per person. It tells you how many, how many cabbages do I need if I wanna feed a family of four, it'll tell you that. It's got that all on that, this, this pretty sophisticated uh, list. I'll give that, I'll email that to you if you want to give me your email. It was just too too big and too many sheets of paper and I've been having printer issues. Ink, paper, <laughs> even this one I, I hit print and said give me 50 yeah. and then uh, it ran out halfway through and didn't print last night and feed more paper into it. These things are a beast. These, this, this equipment, it needs to be fed ink and paper. Anyway, I'll get that to you probably later today or, or depends on how many emails I get. Maybe it's Monday or Tuesday. It'll get to you pretty quick. Okay. Point being for now, start with frost dates, when it ends, when it begins. Uh, the next thing to watch is your soil prep. Have you dug a hole in your yard lately? It's pretty bad. Mountain soils, they're pretty bad. I basically abandoned the whole idea in my yard. I just said containers or raised beds. That's what I garden in. Flowers and vegetables, especially. Trees and shrubs. I can amend that soil enough to where I can kind of make a difference. But my smaller rooted, more sensitive things where I need production now, I need color now, I got a party in three weeks, I need it pretty now. Those things I want to regulate a little better, fruiting things especially. Um, there I want to have good soil. And it might look rich. You might have that loam from underneath your oaks or your pines, but really those leaves and those needles break down so slowly that they really don't make that big a difference in, in as far as soil structure. You need to actually add some compost. Compost or peat moss. Um, for me, I'm gonna switch mine out. My flowers are going from my containers into my raised bed, and my vegetables that were in my raised beds are going into my containers. Now I have a lot of containers, and they're big. So I've got uh, potatoes and earth boxes. I've got a lot of vegetables in containers. Uh, and they're pretty if done correctly. I'll give you some examples of what I'm actually going to plant this afternoon. Um, so with that, make sure your soil perks. Make sure it has plenty of compost. These things are, are they need to get their roots out quickly into the soil. And if it's a real tight or fine uh, soil, the roots get stuck and they can't root out enough to get your production. This is a fairly short season that we have. It really says we're 163 days of growing season, but really it's not. It's 163 days and then the plants shut down at night. It gets so cool in the evening, plants don't keep growing. So really what you'll find is you're, where you're used to growing, you're seeing a larger plant sooner. Here it'll be about half paced. Plants will be about 20, 25% smaller than you're used to in other parts of the country, California, there are, wherever you're from. Uh, because the dryness gets to your plants. It dwarfs, makes the leaves smaller. The fruits are sometimes smaller. So the aridness and the, the cool nights play out differently for us. So you want to mend that soil so you can get your roots out just as fast as you can. So I would say if you've got a raised bed or any kind of garden, you should put a two to three inch layer every year and turn it to one shovel's depth into your soil. Manure is good. You folks out Chino, Paulden, Horse, Skull Valley, Ranch Country, 
you know it's really easy to get free manure don't just do manure like add, add some other compost in there as well uh, we're notorious for having tomatoes that grow huge really fast as tall as you and I and it hasn't set fruit one yet that's always because we front-loaded the soil with manures and had too much nitrogen and so we got all this green growth and then the tomato forgot to slow down long enough to set a fruit. So kind of watch how much manure. All manure and nothing else is maybe, maybe that's committed too much. Maybe you have too much manure <laughs> to my friends, okay? To your full of BS or something, something like that. Okay, so manure is good. Watch that one and watch it in your own gardens. Now if that gets into the case, we can show you that happens. We can show you how to kind of get out of it. And I'll kind of touch on that towards the end. But uh, kind of what, don't just go all manure. I talked to someone last night, I've got alpacas. I'm going great for you. I use tons of alpaca poo, but good for you. I have my tomatoes, it gets so big every year and they don't, they don't produce fruit, why? You have alpacas, that's why. So kind of watch that one. Um, also, we're very common problem is blossom end rot, okay? It's where the fruit, the uh, uh, blossom touches the fruit. You actually have a nice red tomato, a pepper, squash can do this. And where the blossom was, you'll, it'll start to rot. Your squash will turn yellow, you'll get a black spot on your tomatoes, and it'll start to get this rotted spot on it. The fruit's still harvestable, you have to cut all that out, but it sure makes it ugly, and it's discouraging. It shouldn't be the case. Uh, that is usually a calcium deficiency, almost always. So if you can add calcium into the soil as you're planting the plant, you'll find you'll have less blossom end rot. And I would put it where your tomatoes, peppers, and squashes, pumpkins, those kinds of things, I put it in those areas. Um, it's not as much of a problem for your leafy things. It seems to play out more for your, your basically tomatoes, that kind of stuff is, calcium. Now, where do I get calcium from? Your cheapest form of calcium that you can add in the soil? Gypsum, calcium sulfate. It's inexpensive, it's easy to put in, it doesn't burn. I tend to front load the soil. Before I plant, I'll actually add some of this and turn it to that one shovel's depth. When I'm adding my or organics, I'll add some of this at the same time. I go so far as, as I'm planting, I'll take a little tablespoon and add, add a little bit in the bottom of each hole such a serious problem and then I'll put some of that on I'll kick a little bit of dirt over it and then I'll plant my plants so the roots grow through the gypsum now when you read the bag the bag actually says melts rock makes plants grow in any kind of soil it doesn't do that that's just marketing PR bull and really what it does gypsum what it really does what it's designed for it helps leach minerals out of the soil so in heavier soils like silt to, uh, silt or clay uh, that uh, white powdery gunk that builds up in your sink and your toilets, that also builds up in your soil. This helps to flush that stuff out so the soil will, will drain better. It doesn't really melt rock or change the structure of your soil. It's really good at adding calcium into, where, into your vegetable gardens. It'll make the flowers larger, more robust, better flavor, and keep that doggone blossom end rot, the fruits from rotting on your plants. Really important. I would say real. I would say this is really important. Okay, that's one. We're gonna shotgun this. We're all over. They're kind of going with what I'm, I'm thinking through. What am I going to do when I plant my plants? I'm trying to part that with you, so you can take a piece of that. The other thing I will do, I sprinkle a little bit of Aqua Boost crystals. These are polymer crystals. Polymers. If you don't know what polymers are, they're they're a crystal that that uh, they'll absorb water like 200 times their weight in water. This will actually turn into like five gallon bucket of gelatin, gelatin basically. And so the plants will release that back to my vegetable gardens as it needs it. This is important coming June. June it's 8% humidity, prevailing southwest wind, never stops, and it's 92 degrees. It's hard on plants. So what I'm trying to prevent is keep the wilt factor at the end of the day on my plants. And then sometimes your fruits will get a crack on it because it's swelling. It's, it, it morning it will hydrate. It will swell up in the middle of the day and it will shrink. And so that, that actual movement of the fruit will cause a cracking, especially on tomatoes and things. 
So this helps with all that. So I make sure I sprinkle a little bit on around where that root's gonna be. Uh, if I'm turning my soil, I actually sprinkle enough in at the recommended rate for that layer where the root's gonna be. In my containers, I'll, I'll mix it in that top layer of just containers. It seems to really make a difference, especially in arid climates. It's called Aqua Boost crystals. It's something that we put together here. I know it looks a little cheesy. It's in a ball jar. I mean, I went down to True Value and bought every jar they had and filled them up. We slapped a sticky label on it. Uh, we've also infused the uh, crystals with mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi are they're the beneficials. They're they're the uh, they're, there's beneficial worms, fungi, uh, bacteria that 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 stimulate. Uh, plants where they want to root, they go, oh, they, the plants are checking out the soil, their environment. They're going, do I want to root here? They're actually checking it out. And before they'll root, they're looking for mycorrhizal colonies, worms, that kind of stuff. And so this, we're, we're actually adding some of those mycorrhizal colonies back into the soil. So now you got a plant that encourages the plant, the, the, your, your vegetables to grow, to root, and it holds a moisture in around the root mass. So I buy the biggest bottle I can find, I find that I make at the garden center. And this is probably a season's worth for myself. I do a lot of planting. You might only need a pint size or eight ounce. We have three different sizes. If you can a lot, you'll recognize all the sizes. And so we just fill them up and stick them stick with aqua boost crystals. I will use this with my vegetable gardens or any of my containers and raised beds. I add that in there. Okay, those two things are most important for me, for myself. And the soil structure, just adding, adding some, uh, some organics. Now I'm gonna plant my containers. I've been growing in these containers. These are pretty beautiful glazed pots. I mean, they're pieces of art by themselves. I'm gonna plant in them. Last year's roots, I'll try to dig out some of those roots, because as roots, if they're left over from last year, um, Roots, the way they work, they'll tend to, to, as they break down, they'll taint the soil. They actually poison the soil. It's nature's way of, of thinning the forest, basically. So when, when a tree dies, as that root structure uh, breaks down and compost, it prevents anything else from going in that space until it's actually broken down. It's how God intended nature to work. I mean, it's just, this is how it works. And so if you know that about nature, you know some of those roots are going to break down compost and prevent other root structures from forming in there, get rid of the roots. Get them out of there. Get that top layer. I try to look for physical, I'm trying to take a physical chunk out of there so I can add some fresh potting soil back into those containers. So if you've had a struggle where you, you grew in that, that container for a couple of years, things did great, and all of a sudden they aren't doing as well, that's probably the reason. You haven't replaced enough You've got some old chunky things, just leftover material. There's a, there's a vitality to soil, and the plants do use it up with age. So you need to introduce some new, new physical potting soil back into your containers or your raised beds. What I'll do is I usually have my garden tub sitting there. I dig out that, just the top layer, not the whole thing, just, just where I see most of the, the old roots are. I'll take that and I'll use that soil. I'll just top dress my flower beds. I'll place it around the yard at that point. If I've got holes I want to fill up, I'll use it there. I'm not throwing it away. I'm just allowing it to further break down out there where I need a lot of, of activity quickly. I'm looking to add more fresh soil. Okay, tr trust me, that really plays out. Um, okay, where are we at now? Fertilizer, should we cover that? Food. These plants are very heavy feeders. Uh, um, they're, they're just really heavy. To put on that much fruit, you're gonna put on five pounds of fruit on this big old bush, and you're gonna harvest it five times this year. It takes a lot of energy to produce that. And so you need to encourage um, foliage growth at first. Then you truly really wanna starve your tomatoes of nitrogen and then give it more phosphorus. So it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. Nitrogen, the first number, is green growth, foliage. If you want more leaves, um, you, you put it on foliage. That's why lawn foods have like 21, zero, zero. We don't want any flower or any seed heads on your grass. We want nothing but green, green, green. So 
So that's what that causes. That's why manure is mainly nitrogen. Can you see the problem if you put too much in there and you don't have enough phosphorus? Phosphorus forms fruits and roots. If you want more flowers, more fruits, more, more a bigger root mass, you give it phosphorus. That's what you really want to focus on. Bone meal, zero, ten, zero. It's all phosphorus. So it promotes. That's why you put it underneath bulbs and flowers and potatoes. Put it there because we want more roots. Um, potash, really we have enough potash in our soils. We don't need a lot more. Potash, really what it does, it forms a disease resistance. Thicker leaves, sturdier stems. That's really what, what that particular element's for. We have so much naturally occurring potash in our soil. Um, um, some butte is an old volcano core. That's the core. All the ash that was around the core has settled down in the valleys. We're literally surrounded by ash. They actually harvest some of it and use it as top dressing. That's that purple rock they, they have pull out of the ground. A lot of this is just old volcano ash. You don't really want to add any more ash in your soil. You've got enough. Even your water has, got, has been tainted by all the ash that we have. So really don't put any of your barbecue ash or your fire pit ash. Don't put that into your garden. It's not a good thing. You'll kill your, your plants that way. That's something you do in the East Coast. That's something you do in the Midwest. You don't do that here. Because of all the, all the hilltops you see around here, they're all volcano cores. And so we've got lots of ash already. So I've seen a lot of mistakes made by newbies. I don't want my friends to make the same mistake. Uh, by, putting, by putting barbecue ash or fire pit ash or in, in their soil. Don't, don't do that. What it also does is it raises the pH. Your pH is already, I took our, we've got a big fancy commercial grade pH tester. I took it home, took some tap water, and said, I wonder if pH is, thunk, 9.0. Those of you that have, have had pools and spas, you know, it goes from like zero to 10. And getting close to either side is bad. The book says 6.5 to 6.8 is the perfect pH. You'll never reach that here. Our water has been tainted by all that volcanic ash. Ash is very alkaline. And so it raises the pH of your water. Every time you water, the water is the enemy. Every time you water, the soil naturally will float up to whatever the pH of your water is, your soil will take on the same pH. So if your plants start to yellow or stop blooming or they shed their blossoms or their fruits, that's usually going to happen in the June, July, August, after you've tried to get through all the heat of June and you've watered a little more than normal, the pH starts to go up. And so all of a sudden the plants will start yellowing, they'll stop fruiting. It's something to watch and it's unique to this little tiny bubble in the southwest. Only we have this issue. The rest of the country says, sprinkle lime on the soil. Lime will sweeten the soil. Have you heard that? Don't do that here. You'll kill your plants. You've taken 9.0 and raising the pH, you will literally sterilize your soil. It's possible. I've done it. School of Hard Docs, I know we learn gardening, right? By making mistakes. Okay, I've killed off a whole hillside by checking, by changing the pH. Don't do that yourself, okay? We want to constantly lower the pH. So in my container gardens, I'm using a good potting soil, and the main ingredient is, is peat moss. Peat moss is very, very acidic with good drainage. I mean, pot, a good potting soil is going to, well, it should be the perfect medium that you can just put it in, fill up a pot and pull, plant right in it. A good potting soil should really, let's see if we can show it this one. That's what a good potting soil looked like. In fact, if you could find, fill your, your gardens up with that soil, the same soil the plants are rooted in, that you, you'll plug that plant and it'll go, oh, perfect, more soil, I'll just grow here. Plants do not like to change from one soil type to another. They will stall. As soon as they find a different kind of soil, they go, whoa, I'm gonna wait it out and just see if I really wanna do this where I will go into any other soil besides that one until, until I have to go there, I'm not going there. They just, as soon as they see a different kind of soil, they stop. So you wanna, you wanna use a good 
that, that, that mix, if you want to know what it looks like, just pull any plant out and go, I want that soil. It's got peat moss, it's got compost, perlite, there's little uh, white specks. Um, that's kind of what you want to look for. Um, our water's potting soil, that is our grower's mix. So we call it water's potting soil. That's, that's this, that's what, that's what that is. It's what our grower put together and he, he put it so that our plants will, will grow faster, stronger. So watch for that one, drainage. pH, that lower the pH. In my raised beds, I actually put physical sulfur, soil sulfur. Soil sulfur is the opposite of lime. Soil sulfur makes things more acidic, brings the pH down. Lime makes things more alkaline, raises the pH. This is kind of, we're into the technical chemistry of, of soil, but it really comes down to soil chemistry. And it's your water is doing that to you. Your water is very high in pH, so you want to always try to correct, always try to push down the pH. You'll never reach where the book says you need to be. You'll never reach 6.5. You just, unless you're using rain harvest or you got other water sources besides groundwater, groundwater is going to be very alkaline. If you're on your own well, it could be even worse. It seems like the wells are higher. And the city water seems to change depending on which water, which well, which tank the city is pulling from to feed the city at the time. So it's, it'll actually change pH throughout the growing season. Just personal experience. And I'm checking this stuff. So, yeah. Did you add uh, the sulfur several times during the growing season? So, do I add the sulfur several times? I only add the sulfur one time. Once, in the spring. When I'm first turning the soil, when I'm first getting, when things are first waking up, I add it then. And I get the biggest bag of sulfur I can find. And when I'm fertilizing the whole yard with all-purpose plant food, I put sulfur down at the same time. This is a great food for edibles because the main ingredient in this is cottonseed meal. Those of you, and how many of you have used all-purpose plant food? Well, over half the group. Good. The main, you know, it kind of has an earthy kind of natural smell. I, I know it's like it's like magic to gardeners, but sometimes you're just getting new in the garden. And you're going, ooh. That smells like earthy. Um, it's cottonseed meal is the main ingredient. Cottonseed meal um, is very acidic. It also increases blossoms, uh, fragrance and flowers, flower size. There's a lot of benefits. So that's amazing. It's got some bird guano and fairy dust and other stuff we put in the bag. Okay, it's something we put together for here. Um, it's also got sulfur. We, we know we're going to try to help you counteract your water. We actually put sulfur in this. No other national company does it. They all put lime in. So anyway, that, that's a good mix. If, if, uh, this one I cannot call organic because you're putting minerals in. As soon as you put sulfur or iron in it, you can't call it technically. I mean, I know it's natural, but you can't call it truly organic. We do put an actual 100% organic for the purest. This is 100% organic. It's tomato and vegetable food. It's really, really good made of meat meal, feather meal, we put different kinds of meals, and it's pelletized. So you don't have to blend it yourself and try to figure out the formula. We, we've done all the homework for you. So put some of those in. Uh, really, I put those in. I've already put those into my soil. I've already turned them into one shovel's depth. Sulfur, sulfur tomato, vegetable food, turn, gypsum into one shovel's depth with some more compost. Turned it, and I'm simply going to go and plug plants because the soil has been ready to go for two, three weeks. Okay. That's how I do my soil. That's how I prep. Those are all, those are my kind of getting ready. Should we go into the actual plants? What kinds of plants I'm using? So tomatoes is really, it was touted as grow your own vegetables or grow your own, what was, what was the title? Grow your own groceries. There you go. But really it's tomatoes. 80% of all gardeners grow tomatoes. That's, there's, I mean, store-bought tomatoes. I made some pico de gallo last night. Roma tomatoes, Safeway. It was awful, okay? It wasn't the same. As fresh picked, they melt in your mouth. They're so good. Um, so how do you get to that stage? Indeterminate, indeterminate. There's two types of tomatoes. You'll see a bunch of tomatoes over there. Determinate, indeterminate. What is the difference? How do you even remember? Even I have a hard time. This is how this gardener remembers. Determinate. It's determined to grow to one size and one size only and then it stops. These are typically your bush sizes. Patio tomatoes, 
celebration tomatoes. I think big boy, heat wave, they're all determinate. You'll see that, determinate. They're generally made for containers. They stay smaller, fuller, bushier. Um, if you put a cage on them, they easily stay within the cage. They don't outgrow. Then there's the indeterminate. Indeterminate is more of a vine tomato. Does that help you kind of decide between the two? Indeterminates be like your early girls, your, your uh, champions, uh, beefsteaks. These are huge. They get bigger than you and I. You put a cage on it, the biggest one you could find, and still you have to stake it and it keeps going. Those are all indeterminate. Okay, that's just a real quick down and dirty. Indeterminate generally put on flushes of fruits all season long. So if you want fresh table type of tomatoes, go indeterminate because you'll always have a few tomatoes all the time. If you love canning or sauces or, or preparing things, you generally want to go determinate like Roman tomatoes. They're wonderful fresh off the vine. They're terrible in the store. But on the vine, if you want to do a lot of canning, go with Romas because they're determinate. They'll get most of their crop all at once so you've got enough to work with. So just a few plants, you can have a lot of tomatoes, enough to can and do all your, your stuff with. So that's, a, that's how I kind of, in my head, how I try to, to, to do the difference. I'm gonna mainly go with determinate this year, because I'm in containers. And I don't, want to eat, I don't need a 10 foot tomato. that goes up the vine, up the stake, and then out over and flow over the patios. So I, I'll have a few of them where they're strategic, like I love early girl, that's my favorite. I'm, I'm a salsa garden kind of guy. We mainly grow peppers. I love pepper, grilled peppers, oh, filled with cheese and sausage. Oh, they're like wonderful. I can live on those. Um, uh, tomatoes, onions, garlic, cilantro. Those are our kind. That's what Lisa and I like to do. So we can live on pico de gallo all season long. We go out and harvest. Okay. So look look for those. Um, what else? Cages. They're beautiful. They're pieces of art anymore. You probably do want to cage, but you don't have to cage. At the front edge of my uh, uh, raised beds, I'll put tomatoes in front of it. I just let them flow over, out and down, and, and, and fruit by themselves. They're beautiful plants. I mean, big, whining plants aggressively growing with little tiny fruits. They don't have to be caged. The reason that we cage them is so you can get more plants per square foot. That's the whole reason. But I've used these to grow beans on. I've used these to grow cucumbers. You can grow just about everything on a cage. Um, I turn it upside down on my big pots so that I can uh, I use it almost like a cage this way so I can tie my, my peppers up, kind of get things over this way to it. I'll show you what I'm going to do with that in just a minute. But um, if, you have, if you have stale, old, galvanized, I mean, they're kind of old school. I mean, your grandparents used those cages. I spray paint them colors as I turn them into art. I'm, I generally bend towards the art. I'm a designer. I like the artistic piece of landscape. You can smell it, touch it, feel it. You can just experience a good garden. Well, this is part of the experience, my cages. I actually spray paint them, so they're fun. And I'll put them right by the front door. I'll have flowers at the base of them, and people will walk up and go, oh, what a great idea. That's so pretty. Wow, would you come up with that? I went, just, I just spray paint. And it's a tomato plant. But I just went outside. I'm way past the tomatoes must be in a line and march through the, through the garden by themselves. I intermix much of my, my, my gardens. So flowers are in there. They're in my shrubs. They're just every place. So you walk in my backyard. I got tomatoes and flowers over here. And I got them over there. And you're just surrounded. There's nothing more beautiful than a pepper plant. Peppers are, where are my peppers? Do I have peppers? Look at that. Beautiful green, waxy leaf. Puts on a little tiny flower that's kind of insignificant. Then it puts on great big fruits. It's pretty. All the kids go from to my backyard. They go, oh, can I pick one? I'm not sure. Just don't touch your eyes afterwards. It might sting. I don't know. But they're, they're, they can be absolutely beautiful. I, I'm giving you permission to get outside of just this can be my vegetables are here and nowhere else. We don't live on the farm anymore. This is our house. 